Hi, and hello, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, talking about intersectionality and whether it is a distraction to what is important. I'm going to be showing some slides very shortly, and I think that is important while we are absolutely in the spirit of conversation and discussion. I thought it would be really helpful to go through a little bit of content so that in some ways we kind of like set the scene and lay the stall and then have a conversation about what this might mean. And um, from hearing the conversation or from hearing the introduction, um, some of you might be thinking, um, yes, well, lots of, you know, kind of affiliations in the academic context. Um, absolutely, I have for the last uh, 10, 12 years um, been involved in research in this space. Uh, but in that time, in fact, slightly longer, I've been working as an organizational psychologist. So what is really important to me is thinking through how we make progress to get the best out of leadership and diversity while applying what we understand um, from the research. So I'm sharing my screen now and I'm just going to talk you through a couple of kind of concepts, ideas um, to provoke the discussion around the extent to which intersectionality may or may not be a distraction with regards to what's important. And then after that, I will stop sharing screen and we'll go back to have the conversation. So first question to everyone. I expect that of the 200 plus people in this call, the vast majority of them are familiar with the concept, at least with the word intersectionality. And I have a question for you. You can put it in the chat and we can look at it when I've put down the slide as part of our conversation. But how would you define intersectionality? What is intersectionality? When you think about the word intersection, what comes to mind? And I'd really invite you to, to just take a moment and actually either type, type in the chat or reflect to yourself, how would I define intersectionality? If I had a seven-year-old niece or a seven-year-old child, what would I tell them? And the reason I ask this question is to give us um, a little bit of an insight into the way in which we understand the notion of intersectionality vis-a-vis -vis different identity dimensions. And I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to that depending on, um, you know, just hold your definitions there. So, if we go on to thinking through how we look at ourselves and how we identify, many of us on the call will, would have recognized that broadly speaking, when we think about the social justice work, that broadly speaking, um, uh, there's been a lot of focus historically on advancing the gender agenda. And so it's like, okay, you know what, what is the situation? Let's look at women, let's look at men, let's look at the ways in which women have been marginalized or oppressed vis-a-vis -vis men and let us fix it. And then we know, of course, that we then have conversations around, okay, yeah, okay, well, there is an issue about um, ethnicity or race, social identities linked to melanin and skin tone and culture, um, but particularly race and ethnicity. And then we say, okay, let's put people into a different set of categories. Are they white? Are they mixed? Are they Asian? Are they black? Are they other? And the first thing that intersectionally draws attention to is that this is a false dichotomy. It assumes that we either have gender or we either, or we have ethnicity. And we all know on this call that that is not the case. Everyone who falls within a gender identity category, more or less in the world we have created, falls into an ethnic racial category. You cannot separate them out in terms of our lived experiences, in terms of like who we are and our identities. 
And I just use that as a prefix, as a kind of precursor into the next um, conversation that I want to have with you, which is with regards to where the term came from. So intersectionality is a term that was coined by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw in the early 80s. Professor Kimberly Crenshaw came across, her background is in law, she's a critical legal scholar, and she came across a, a, a challenging case study. And so I'm going to talk about that case study at a very high level, just for um, this purpose. So this was a legal case study, and in essence, a bunch of women who were Black were saying an organization had discriminated against them, and those, the, and those women were unable to work because of the policies in place by this organization. And these Black women were putting this case for discrimination forward. And the judge broadly said, uh-uh, no, there's been no discrimination, because when you look at this organization, there's women employed in this organization. And when you look at this organization, there's black people in this organization. So as black women, you have no right to claim that you've been discriminated against. And then Professor Crenshaw was like, uh-uh. When you look at this organization, the type of women who've been um, employed or recruited are white women in receptionist roles. And the type of black people who've been recruited in this organization are black men in more operational cleaning industrial roles, like back office cleaning maintenance roles. So yes, women have been employed, but specific types of women in forward facing, you know, kind of almost like the service, I'm the front of the organization, I'm the acceptable, you know, kind of service role as a, as a white woman. And the type of black person that was employed were black men kind of, you know, oper operating the machines, etc. There was no room for black women in that organization. Without an intersectional lens or an intersectional perspective, the racism that was happening particular to the Black women's experiences and the sexism that was happening particularly to Black women's experiences in that um, case study would not have surfaced. And so Professor Crenshaw helped us understand that the relationship between two different categories are so interlocked that they can explain a particular set of circumstances that ordinarily we would not have seen. Professor Kimberly Crenshaw continues to do work and she has a, her, um, her, one of her most recent movements is hashtag say her name. A number of people on the call may well be familiar with it. And that work is still pertinent because a question to you, when we stop and we think through the issue of police brutality in the United States and we think about names of people that have been killed by police in the US, I guarantee you that 90% of the names that we will come up with collectively are names of black men. We do not remember the black woman and other women of color or other LGBTQ individuals of color who have been victims of police brutality. And so the hashtag say her name is to emphasize that the people who are being killed by police in the United States are not just black men. And there's a different set of circumstances. So the police brutality and the relationship with racism are different for black men and black women. In other words, when we think through intersectionality, the notion of an intersect, it means to cross. It's the meeting point of two or more identity dimensions. Intersecting emphasizes that crossing one identity with another alters the meaning of the thing that we want to look at. So some could argue, and I'm probably in that camp, that intersectionality actually 
helps us look more closely, helps us understand in a more advanced, nuanced way, the racism or the anti-racism work that we want, the racism we want to deconstruct or the anti-racism work we want to get into. So a question I'm posing is the extent to we to the extent to which we can actually avoid talking about racism if we talk about intersectionality. Within the concept of intersectionality is the idea of how is this racism, for example, influenced by other identities, because it probably is, and it probably means different things for different people. In the rest of my conversation with you, I'm going to share some of the ways in which I've applied intersectionality in the work I do. And I know there are many people on this call who um, work in a range of different contexts. So my context is organizational psychology and leadership. And so those are the examples on which I'm going to draw. But of course, this is not limited to that. It's just that's where my experience is. And that's where I feel I am. Um, I have the legitimacy to, 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 and the experience to talk about. And I just want to start with this quote, what part of me needs greater development? And I start that because I was working um, as a coach with a, um, with a woman of color who works in a professional organization. And in the same week, the following happened. One week she had a phone call, she had a meeting with her line manager and her line manager is talking about her, um, her progress He's saying, you know, you're doing really good work. Actually, I think you need to go to the woman's leadership program because that's really good. It will set you up for, you know, success in our organization. The same week, this woman gets an email from HR and OD saying, congratulations, you've been nominated to attend the BME Black Minority Ethnic Leadership Program. And then she's on the phone to me and she's like, doing, I don't know what to do. Which part of me needs greater development? How? are we in a position where we're asking a young woman of color who's talented on her way to the top of one of the leading organizations in this country, in the world, and we're asking her to figure out whether her gender needs development or her race needs development. What we need is a solution that wraps up and acknowledges that all of her experiences linked to racism are influenced by her gender, by her class, by her culture, by her religion, by her sexual orientation, and, and all of her relationships or her experiences linked to her ethnicity are influenced by her gender. It may be to a greater or lesser extent for different people, but we shouldn't be in a position where we're asking people to figure out which part of their lives needs greater development. And I know like even the question is somewhat problematic, so forgive me for presenting it that way. And so I invite you to reflect on this. How has your experience of racism or your experience of privilege based on race? How has that been shaped by your other identities? I invite you to pause and reflect and maybe invite also add in the chat and we'll come back to it when we open it up for conversation. Has your experience of racism been shaped by your other identities? I think the answer is likely yes. But it's also often really helpful to surface those. And I just want to give you one example. One example. I was walking down the street of Atlanta a few years ago with another Black woman who is a dear friend, who is as educated as I, 
you know, a, a number of you on the call might recognize the fact that um, a lot of black people, so not just Americans, love Atlanta because there's so many black people, there's really good food, there's really great clubs, you know, like as a black person, you just kind of, you're okay in, in, in some, in many ways, not in every way, of course. And we were having a good time. We were walking down the street, myself and my black female friend. We both grew up in Nigeria. We were both immigrants. So in many ways, our experiences of blackness were similar for all of the reasons I've just told you. We were both Nigerian and we're walking down the streets of Atlanta. There's one more piece of information I'm about to share with you is my dear friend for whom, who I've known for 35 years is Muslim and I'm Christian. We're walking down the streets of Atlanta and there was someone who was handing out sweets, kind of, you know, like candy, handing out tasters. And my friend was closer to him. Um, I was on the side of the street. She was on the side of the buildings and he was just in front of this store. And we walked towards him and he, as we, we were walking down the street, walking towards him, and as we approached him, he walked past her, reached across to me, and offered me the candy to taste. We paused, and we did a double take, because she was right there, and she hadn't been offered anything. My friend's experiences as a Black Muslim woman and my experiences as a Black Christian woman are an interplay of our gender, our ethnicity, and the visibility or invisibility of our religions and what that means in society. I have another friend, I beg your pardon, I said I was going to tell you one story. I'll just tell you a second one. Another friend, I'll say this one quite quickly, with whom we both started a PhD, black women who have lots of experiences of, you know, just making sure we kind of check ourselves, of making sure that we, you know, we kind of just think through what context in which people see us, about how we dress. We both started our PhDs together. 10 years on, I finished my, she hasn't because she's a wheelchair user and because she suffers from ME. Her disability or the way in which society has disabled her, has limited her opportunities as a black woman to get her education despite her capacity to do this. And in all of these examples, I am saying, and we don't have time to do this, I'd love to open it up when we, when we do, these experiences are not, it's not, oh yeah, it was because she's Muslim. Oh, it's because, it's only because she's Muslim that this happening. It's because she, my, my, my friend looks like a black Muslim woman with my other friend, oh, it's only because she's sitting in a wheelchair. Mm -mm. Her experiences of being ignored, of being assumed that she doesn't speak English, a, a whole bunch of different things, are a combination of her being a wheelchair user as well as a Black woman. I want to leave you with a couple more specific work-related examples to highlight the value of intersectionality. One of the ways in which we could make use of intersectional thinking is based on this story, which is based on a true story, another woman of color I coached. This woman works in the civil service. She is quite senior. She is a, an SES, a senior civil servant. And we are in the middle of a number of different coaching conversations. I'm just going to tell you two. 
in the first conversation, she says to me, you know what, actually, let's imagine she's called Serena and she says, I'm so excited. I have an interview coming up in a different government department. I can't wait for this interview. I think I'm really ready for this because this interview is on the basis, is, is, is with someone with whom I have spoken to on the phone many times before. So Serena is a senior civil servant in one part of the of the ministry of the of the government. She is looking for a job opportunity in another government department. The projects are aligned in that or the roles are aligned, the functions are aligned in that she's had many conversations, a bunch of different conversations. This was her expression with this other person who leads this other um, function in this other government department. Right. Okay, so Serena works in the civil service, has been there for years. Um, she is of Jamaican heritage, but she, you know, she sounds like she's been in the civil service for years. And, you know, that's code for, you know, she sounds posh and her name is Anglo, you know, as again, for, um, for many people of Caribbean heritage, it's not unusual at all for you to have um, an, an, um, um, a European sounding, a, a name that many people uh, would record, would assume is 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 European, and I say all of this to set you up to the story. And I think a number of people on this call will kind of know where this is going. So. She's spoken to him on the phone a whole bunch of times. She's walking in ready for this interview because she knows, actually, I'm about to have a meeting face to face with this person who knows me and who already knows the work that I do. Part one of the story. The second part of the story, Serena walks into this interview, reaches her hand out. She's ready, confident, about to meet this person. And in that split second, she notices that he halts. He just pauses a little. There's just a little more of a, ooh. His handshake is a little weaker than she expected. It's a little faltering. And again, for many people on this call, that will not be too much of a surprise because what's happened is this interviewer, let's call him John, has spoken to Serena many times on the phone, has inferred from her accent, has inferred from her name. He knows what her gender is, but he's inferred possibly that she is not a person, a woman of color. If he was speaking to me, it is highly unlikely that would have happened because my name would have signaled my voice would have signaled that I was a woman. My name would have signaled that I was probably a woman of color. And I'm unlikely at that moment to have received that halt, that, ooh, I wasn't expecting that. And I wonder whether if all of us collectively thought about how racism broken down when we think about gender and culture and identity and heritage, that gives us a flavor into the different ways in which some of us experience otherness, vis-a-vis -vis the fact, despite the fact that we all have the same skin tone when we look specifically at black people. We might be able to preempt this sort of, this sort of stereotype threat, which meant that throughout that interview, Serena wasn't sure whether she belonged because of the impact that micro moment had had at the start of her interview. Just going to move on. So the other benefit that we could get from um, intersectional thinking is challenging leadership archetypes. Before I go into specifics of intersectional thinking, I want to remind us of something many of us are familiar with, is when we think through the relationship between gender and leadership roles. One of them is that women generally are considered to not be quite tough enough and not be tender enough in leadership positions. So sometimes we hear women say, or we hear people say, well, you know what? Mm, yeah, women in leadership, 
You need to be not edgy, but not without edge, soft, but not too soft. It's the double bind of women in leadership. But I want to bring an intersectional perspective to that. And with this, after this, I'll draw this conversation, this bit to a close. So remember the double bind, women too soft, women too tender, too tough or too tender. The challenge is that when we bring black women into the conversation, black women don't face the stereotype of being tender and soft and nurturing and, 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 and caring. Black women in leadership positions and more generally tend to face an overemphasis on the tough side of being aggressive and threatening. On the other hand, Asian women tend to face the stereotype of being modest and unassuming and are hardly ever faced with the, well, you know what, nah, you need to soften up, you need to too, too tough, you need to kind of calm down. So there are different implications for women of color when we look at what it means for black women and what it means for Asian women. And the last thing I want to say, this is something you might want to look up, is the teddy bear effect, which has been found as a way in which black men in leadership positions actually have to soften their look through wearing glasses, for example, hunching their shoulders because of the stereotypes of black men in power and the stereotypes around being aggressive. And I say this to invite us to think through, actually, when we think about the impact of anti-racist action, when we look at leadership positions in organizations and the archetypes of leadership, just looking at race without looking at, for example, ethnicity will only take us so far. And so to close, I think we can address intersectionality without feeling that other issues have been diluted. In fact, I think quite the opposite. I think if we address intersectionality, we can make some meaningful impact in anti-racist work. And I would encourage us all to inject intersectional thinking into single strand discussions. Try a brain teaser, whatever it is you're looking at, just think, how would this be different if? And another tip or ask is to analyze your data, whatever you have using an intersectional lens. I'm going to draw this to a close right now, but if we, if you want more examples of what that could look like, I'd be very happy to share that. Thank you so much for this time and this opportunity. It's been wonderful speaking to you and I look forward to opening up the conversation. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank Diane for that wonderful presentation. And I don't know how you do like an audience loud clap um, over Zoom, but um, brilliant stuff. Um, so much food to, for thought um, for us all to think about. Um, so I'm just gonna summarize some main points and then really open the floor for questions. We've got some questions in the box coming through already, but um, I do encourage you all out there to pipe up and jump in um, and join us in this discussion. And, and really, I think what Diane's offered us is a wonderful invitation, uh, you know, a, a, a more than a moment, but a, a lifetime <laughs> of opportunities for reflection here. Um, talking about really these kind of cases and real life incidents in which we can see certain issues, certain people concerns really just slipping through the cracks of our understanding of what it means to do equalities work, what justice looks like. Um, and so both those kind of personal reflections, I think are an invitation, um, um, as you've rightly put before us to really kind of consider these policy and structural implications, whether it's in the workplace, as you so rightly talked about, or whether it's in these personal opinions, you know, experiences in our everyday social lives. And, and so really the challenge I think is, is to continue this reflection. Um, and, and I think the point you made about leadership and how these kind of, we now have so much more research observing the effects and the impacts of the failure to consider intersectionality that in some ways, 
Um, the gauntlet has really been laid down over the years since um, Dr. Crenshaw originally coined the term. We just have so much more information and issues that are on the table, including a number um, that I've seen raised in the chat so far, whether it's intersections around disability and class and transgender and, and all these other um, kind of identities that, um, you know, that we need to be included in these discussions. And so, like I say, it's really to begin to open the floor. So I'll take a couple of, I'll start off with a couple of questions that have come through on the chat. Um, and like I say, if anyone has anything else to add, um, keep throwing them into the room and we'll get to as many as we can. So first question um, is, what does intersectionality have to say about class? Um, someone's asked, for example, we know that white boys perform, uh, perform less well educationally compared to Asian boys. Doesn't that just mean we should focus on class? And, and I think I just want to chip in before you answer. This is such an important question because I think race and class are often pitted against each other. Um, and so understanding how they operate together is crucial. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Gabby. So first off, thank you to all of the con contributions in the chat, including the definitions of intersectionality, some great ones there, and how to, you know, respond to seven year olds, um, some great ones there. And then we're, we're saying, all right, let's think through this example using class. And uh, this is a guidance, or this is a like a suggestion or, you know, an offer to everyone on the call, whenever we add a different dimension, add it for everyone. And by that, I mean, if we're looking at white boys of lower class, let's look at, for example, black boys of lower class, black girls of lower class, Asian girls of lower class. That way we are comparing like with, you know, we are, we're looking at it holistically. So um, my, uh, I don't have the data to hand, while white boys of lower class are almost definitely disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis the white boy gener um, population generally, it's more accurate to actually compare white boys of lower class to other people of lower class, which is, you know, I'm so sorry, that's been so kind of clumsily put. I think it's a great question and it's just a, a great example of saying, well, what does intersectional thinking look like and how do we practice it? So um, for, forgive the clumsiness in, in my response. I hope the answer, um, you know, the essence of the answer was clear. Well, can, can I, I can add something to that in, in terms of resources that I really encourage anyone interested about this question to look at is David Gilborn's work. Um, in particular, he's got an article called The Monsterization of Race Equality, How Hate Became Honorable. And in that article, he's also got others like Racism as Policy, which is another great one, a critical analysis of race um, of education. And part of what Gilborn's work highlights is how data is manipulated to really push certain narratives and one of although as Diane rightly said obviously working class white boys are much worse off than middle class white boys in terms of their outcomes across a host of kind of life circumstances um, it's also the case that certain data is manipulated to generate a certain narrative that's divisive such that the kind of organizing between white working class and racialized people doesn't happen that's been so effective in terms of tackling all equality. So I really encourage anyone interested in that to have a check out um, David Gilborn's work. Um, so let's move on. So second question, um, does talking about intersectionality let organizations off the hook for talking? So this is really the crux of our question this evening. Um, so now you get to answer it. What's your elevator pitch? Um, does it let them off the hook of talking about racism? I think it does if the people in the room don't understand what intersectionality is, but now we have 234 people who do, so <laughs> go out and disrupt. <laughs> yeah, it, it, exactly. I think to think that intersectionality doesn't talk about racism is just not to understand what the word means. <laughs> um, so yeah, in, in a nutshell. Okay, so Someone else asking, what's your message to movements that aim to progress anti-racism? How could intersectionality help them in their work and, and could it? 
thank, the, 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 thank you for that question. This is why I'm so excited that so many of us are in here and um, you know we're, we're a part of the Equality <laughs> Republic. My answer is as often as you can inject intersectional thinking into it. What is the thing we're looking at? What is the issue? What is the movement? What are we trying to disrupt? How does it differ for different types of people in that category? And that forces us to be more nuanced, to ask different types of questions, and to provide solutions that actually, I would say, in many ways, are much more likely to address the, 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 the barriers um, with more specificity and, and, and intentionality. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Gabby, can, I, I could say something on this actually, yeah, because I think that yeah. sometimes the blandness by which we try to create uh, movements within organisations means that people don't feel as if they can be part of a, a cause because they don't think the cause talks to them. I think if we can think more critically about how people experience issues such as racism and that, that it could be quite different it allows for people to come together, but not identifying that people might experience a different, um, uh, you know, something different in the organisation because of those intersects often means that people fragment out and they kind of go off and start their other thing. And it doesn't, it, it does, it, it has impact then I think of watering down some of what potentially could be real ammunition um, for social change. So I, I think I've seen that happen quite a lot in our work. Mm. And, and also, if I may, there's something I want to add here as well, is that I think, again, when we're talking, we're really kind of trying to establish what our understanding of intersectionality is. And one of the great um, Black feminists, Audre Lorde, who although didn't coin the term, is very much an intersectionalist in terms of her thinking and politics and, and, and indeed activism. And one of the arguments she makes is that if we really take intersectionality seriously such that we're dealing with, and, and you also see this actually in terms of black feminism throughout um, Christian feminism, you know, throughout the civil rights movement in the US long before the term is actually coined, is it's that notion of dealing with the most disadvantaged person. And if you solve the problems of the most disadvantaged person who in a intersectionally unjust society is a black woman or we can extend that out a, tra a trans woman or a queer black woman um, then you've dealt with class you've dealt with racism you've dealt with sexism and so again I think there's a it's important to understand what from an activism point of view what intersectionality intends is that it's both a focus on, a, on the black woman but not by way of identity it's by way of understanding structurally what's systemically why certain people of certain identities are disadvantaged. And if we tackle those systemic issues, we've solved social injustice for everyone by extension. Gabby, so, I'll, can I just... Can I, oh, sorry, Dawn, you go for it. <laughs> well, yeah. I was just going to jump in, Gabby. I think um, uh, so. I, I'm jumping in because it's linked to one or two questions that have been, but I've just had a really quick view in the chat, which is um, there's one question that in particular per, per, um, uh, someone says, which is, well, I thought intersectionality was about, could have been about all genders and all ethnicity. I mean, this person didn't quite say that, but it was a question about white female. So I'm just looking at it now. I'm going to read it. I was corrected at a meeting when I suggested that intersectionality firstly refers to intersections of oppression, i.e. not white. When I disagreed that white plus female were intersectional, I was, to be honest, speechless. What would have been an appropriate PG response? Um, I'm raising this because what you have said is accurate, purely accurate, where you've said Professor Crenshaw essentially says, from a systemic perspective, let us understand what the structures of oppression are, and racism and sexism are both um, acting and enacting in the, playing out in these women experiences to explain this, um, uh, this inequality. And I just want to flag to people on the call that 
um, there are many different ways in which intersectionality has been used since then. And I think it is important if this is something you want to spend a little time on, it's really important to understand that this came, the term came from um, Kimberly Crenshaw, but has been used in different ways. For example, and I put my hand up in this category because I'm a psychologist, I focus at the individual level I look at personal identities, which is not the original use of intersectionality, which was at systems and structures. Also, because I look in organizations and I work in inclusion, I also bring conversations in about privilege and um, advantaged identities, which <clears throat> is not the history of intersectionality. And I think if we're, if we, if so to answer the question the woman asked, um, Historically, the, the work, the intersectional work focused historically on women of color and the ways in which they had been systemically excluded from power and oppressed. We have, in many of us, are using that thinking in different ways. And I think we need to, or, or have adapted it. And I think we need to acknowledge Professor Crenshaw's initial thought, as well as draw attention to ways in which we might be using it slightly differently. Uh, so Gabby, I just thought, you know, I thought you would love that, that kind of angle. Yeah. Sorry, um, Joy, I know you were talking as well, but I wonder if Gabby has any immediate responses to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things, as you rightly said, Diane, is that the term has been kind of appropriated um, in, in so many different ways nowadays. And actually, Crenshaw's original work, and, and indeed, I was actually at a workshop with her a couple of years ago, where she's deeply concerned about the individualizing of the concept. And her original concept actually had three uses of the term intersectionality. The first was structural, where and and that's a very much akin to Patricia Hill Collins's work where she talks about um the matrix of domination right and so the the intersectionality was understood not as how we experience our identity but how systems of domination intersect to produce certain patterns of equality her second use of the term was political intersectionality which again was systemic but looking at how in the political context certain identities and certain political structures um, again systemically can be produced to create certain outputs and her third use of the term was a representational intersectionality and this kind of intersectionality was really her advocating the need for the representation of black women across these different systems of oppression and different power relations and so I think um well, there's two things. I think there's one really understanding her original use of the term, but I'd also like to throw in um, some work that is far lesser known than Crenshaw's out, outside the kind of ph philosophy circles I um, am more familiar with academically, is the work of Anne Stola. Um, I'm just going to read the book off here. Um, so Anne Stola has a book called Race and, Edu and the Education of Desire, and that book really breaks down the conceptual relationship, not just conceptual, but the historical relationship between the development of gender and race. And so I think that it's important to understand intersectionality as a historical fact in terms of how stereotypes have been formulated both for white women and for black women, because I think the what Stola's arguing is that the kind of stereotypes around for white women that are used to oppress white women were formulated in juxtaposition to black women. It wasn't so so it's so when we're talking about the structural intersectionality, it's to understand that as a historical fact, very much in the way Charles Mills argues for the racial contract being a historical fact. And if we look at Carol Pateman's work on the sexual contract, it's really to know that these systemic questions, nobody actually can opt out of them. You know, it's to assert, you know, this kind of movement towards how do we look at the systemic features. So I think, yeah, flipping it that way, we then, regardless of our own personal identity, um, can see avenues for action in terms of our own work. Um, but I want to jump in now with a with 
the another question that I think really connects with this question about action is, and, and the, the question is, is the law itself, because obviously we know Kimberly Crenshaw is a legal scholar, um, as well as critical race theorists, is the law, and, and I'm taking this that we mean the law in the UK at the moment, but we can, I'm, I know you've got international experience, so you can extend it out um, as far reaching as your expertise allows. Is the law currently sophisticated enough to deal with intersectional cases? Uh, so not 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 a legal scholar and, and by any shot, but I definitely I don't think so. I don't even know that we we even have the you know we we don't even have the terminology enough in our everyday language for it to even have got into it kind of built in, into the law. Um, I mean, I'd I'd love to hear others' thoughts on that, uh, particularly people who are much more closer to to the justice system. Gabby, mm. what are your thoughts? I was going to say I recently um, attended a conference on another Zoom, or, you know, we're all in this Zoom land at the moment, um, with a scholar whose name I'm going to be awful and forget, but I can dig up for future reference, um, who had literally recently, who was publishing work around this specific question in the UK, and she was looking at tribunal cases and looking at um, the success rates according to race, gender and class and these various different um, variables, and what she found was that at for the more likely a, for a claim to be successful, it was successful if it had one axis of complaint. And the more axes of complaints there were, the more likely it was to be an unsuccessful claim. And so I, her work actually, I think, was specifically focusing on disabilities as well. And so if that disabled person was also Black, also female, also, you know, other things, the more the more likely the claim was to be unsuccessful. And so I think very concretely, we've got evidence that shows that the legal system, but also just in terminology, um, in terms of how we collect data, because I think someone had mentioned data before as well. Um, I've recently myself done a report looking at um, teacher training. And one of the things that I found is when you were trying to research you know, wh where are people slipping through the cracks? How is yeah. discrimination, you know, manifest within this system is that the data doesn't allow you to investigate intersectional questions because of the way it's collected and recorded. And so I think one of the ways in which, um, for those of you who are, I don't know, in, in different fields is really just to push that when you collect data, you ask it in a way that allows people to tick multiple categories or refer to themselves in much more complex ways, because then we'll have the information to deal with it. But legally speaking, if you look at the equalities and human rights framing, there are protected categories, but none of those legally permissibly overlap in terms of how the laws applied. And so I think that's an area of real work that needs to be done in equalities Absolutely. and human rights, because as it stands, you are forced to pursue your any cases or any complaints Single you have strand. across one dimension, which is obviously mm -hmm. problematic. So we're in a way we're back where Kimberly Crenshaw was Indeed. in the in the 80s. Yeah. Indeed. I notice a number of people are jumping in. So thank you for that, yeah. for all of those responses. Um, so for others um, who haven't seen the chat, lots of answers to the question in terms of the legal implications or you know the legal limit yeah. limitations. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So I'm I'm conscious of the time. Um, I'm looking at my kind of um, my cl uh, clock and my schedule at the moment. Um, if if it's okay with everyone, we'll take a kind of ten minute um Zoom bathroom, get yourself a drink and a coffee break, and we'll come back and and again open the floor to more questions and conversations with Diane. Hi everyone and welcome back. Um, hope you're all feeling refreshed and ready to go because we've got more questions and um, discussion to be had this evening. So thank you all for staying with us. Um, thank you, Doyen, for being here, of course. Um, so I'm just going to jump back in because we, we've kind of talked about a whole range of things from structure to law and, um, you know, we've run the whole gambit so far. But some of the questions that are coming in are also really to do with drilling down on in terms of personal experience as well. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to put two together because one, I think, is fairly simple um, kind of definitional question and the other gets into gets into the discussion about experience so one person has written in saying um does intersectionality always need to be 
need to include ethnicity and, and gender, are they the two main identities which should always be taken into consideration? Um, so we'll kick off with that one, yeah. Indeed, indeed. well, Gabby, I'd love your thoughts on, on this, and I'm gonna answer more from my biased perspective around kind of organized practice in, in organizations. Um, so let's harken back to before the break where I think it's so important to acknowledge Professor Crenshaw's work. Uh, work. So she centered gender and ethnicity for really good reason. At the same time, for me, when I'm working within an organization and exploring intersectionality, I'm curious about what multiple identities and how do they cross over to mean different things for different people. In that way, I might focus on, for example, just as an example, sexual orientation and disability, for example. So, phew, does it have to historically, if we if we respect the work, we need to acknowledge that. And if we're not going to, I think we should be open about that and understand that we are not doing that. What are your thoughts, Gabby? I think actually, I think in some ways for me, the word you use historically is significant, not, mm. not so much in terms of Crenshaw's work necessarily, mm. but in terms of the historical picture that gives rise for the need for this term in the first place. And I think if we're talking about these questions globally, and but in particular in the UK and, and the West more broadly, we're talking about a conception of Euro modernity in which certain intersections or certain systemic forces coalesce together. And I think they're broader than um, race and gender. So if you look, for example, at Sylvia Winter's work, I've kind of done some work around this as well, um, in terms of conceptually what oppressive power structures was Euro modernity's um, philosophy built on, it was a coalescing of race, ethnicity, sexuality, religion, as you kind of mentioned before, ableism. So all the protected characteristics when we're talking about equalities law, the, the need for those protected characteristics is born out of a particular conception of the human, of what an acceptable human looks like, mm. you know, and, and how they're gendered. And so in that respect, I think the historical picture means all of those identities must be considered. Mm. But I think what, in terms of straying, staying true to Crenshaw's work, the bit that mm. I would like to see people stay true to is mm. really this systemic understanding mm. that it's not about identifying the individual and what their personal identities are. It's mm. about identifying the systems that oppress and that dominate and give rise to certain people's having you know, differential outcomes. Mm -hmm. And if the effort and understanding is directed systemically, then the particulars of an, any given individual's personal experience, and, and I'm kind of raising this because the couple of questions that follow um, are not the target of our observation, the target of our intervention, the target of our, you know, of the work that we must do is about dismantling political structures that privilege certain groups over others. It's about dismantling policies and procedures that, you know, make it difficult for certain people to flourish. Um, and so for me, that's where I think it's important to st stay true to the work is to keep that systemic and structural mm -hmm. rendering of the term. And, and that kind of brings me on to two comments that are related although very disparate uh, uh, questions and um, one person is talking about they live in a homogeneous area specifically Iowa in the USA um, and would like suggestions for bringing this conversation to when the mo majority population is white quite conservative and traditional and doesn't necessarily have experience with folks different from themselves um, and there's a to me although like I say separate but related question I've been seeing in the chat kind of conversations about how do you deal with the complexity of identity and so I'm picking up on the word homogeneous here in the sense that so-called black populations are often understood as homogeneous you know homogeneous in the sense that all black people are like or, or you know and so how do we deal with that kind of complexity in raising these conversations and imagining um, what that intersectional analysis could look like. 
Mm. So that uh, I will, I'll try to answer what I think is the question. Um, so I think there's a question there around, all right, when we think about intersectionality, um, we might be limited to thinking about gender and racism, uh, sexism and racism, and or just building on what you've said just now, Gabby, um, particular issues linked to the lived experiences of women of color. And therefore, if I live in a in a not very diverse place, place in Iowa, for example, I might think, well, actually, that's an issue for women of color. I don't identify as a woman of color. It's a good thing. Deal with it. You know, I will kind of support you from, from the distance. Mm -hmm. And so I think one direct or like implication of that is we are in that, in that story or that picture I've just painted, we are, we are removing ourselves from the narrative, which is actually impossible because we're actually all part of the scenario and all part of the society and all part of the structures. So my first, um, I guess, um, maybe kind of reaction or response to the um, to uh, the participant who put that is there's something about this challenging their assumption that it is about other people because we're all part of it. And if we are all part of it, what is it in our immediate environment that we have that we have power, you know, or access to that helps us think through what can we do in terms of disrupting inequality? So it's not it goes beyond. Well, I don't I we don't have a black woman in our in our neighborhood to possibly what are the policies or procedures in terms of house purchase possibly? in terms of you know the funding in schools possibly that are contributing to the fact that there are no black women where I live possibly I'm just kind of using that as as examples and there, there will be many different pertinent points depending on you know where you are yeah yeah absolutely and and to pick up on some more of the questions coming in are really about mm -hmm. practical um how to's now um yeah people are wanting to get into. So um, somebody has said, how would someone who is black, female and working class safely challenge an organization that wishes to use intersectionality to avoid dealing with race? And a number of comments have yeah. talked about, and, and again, the essence of this question. Um, yeah, how do we go about making sure organizations or whoever um, who wants to use the term as a get out of jail free card. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And that question has come up so often yeah. in the last three or four months, hasn't it? Um, mm -hmm. There's something in my mind about, um, about stay with whatever it is they're looking at. So, uh, so just recently, I was in a conversation where someone said, um, well, you know what, let's stop looking at um, at people of color, we need to kind of focus on the LGBTQ community. And I said, something along the lines of, well, in this conversation, we're talking about people of color. Let us also talk about people of color who are LGBT, who are part of the LGBTQ community. And if this is just a kind of like a side question to our friends on the call, which, you know, all of us, 202 of us, if in that moment you feel a twinge when someone said, let's look at black LGBTQ people after you've said, let's look at LGBTQ people. That's an indicator that you are probably just thinking of white LGBTQ people, which in itself is a reflection of the challenges that we're up against. So by saying, I want to look at, for example, people with disability or people who, um, you know, whatever it is, I'm so sorry, of a, of a particular sexual orientation, when I add another layer to it, and if that layer all of a sudden something hadn't thought about, even though within that community or within that, uh, you know, system, there's many other um, facets of, of, of inequalities and discrimination that reveals to us what we haven't paid attention to. And, you know, I think it's just something to, to bear in mind. Let me, uh, maybe let me try to answer the question um, uh, kind of specifically, kind of directly, like what, what if, if there's a woman who's saying, well, actually, now you're talking about intersectionality and you're kind of 
get it go, going away from from the point, then I would say I'm so glad you're talking about intersectionality. Um, let's look at how all of these different identities um, or systems, how they play out differently for this community that we're looking at. Yeah. Is that, there are no easy answers. I think this is the way no there, there are not one line elevator pitch takeaway. This is what you do. Ta -da. Like I think one of the challenges of intersectionality really is just how pervasive these issues are and how kind of, you know, persistent they are such that the, the answers are, are never that simple. So, um, but but we have another one though to put you on the spot again. <laughs> um, someone has said, I'm here with my partner, we're both educators and we're wondering to what extent should we make students aware of the disadvantage of their intersectional identities? Um, should, to what extent should we? Yes, um, we both think it's important to discuss these issues in the curriculum, but it's a sensitive topic. And I think, yeah, an important one is to, again, what is the direction of how we use the term and, and how do we not demoralize Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Oh, gosh, that. Um, so I'm going to say a couple of things, but it's very possible that Gabby will have a different perspective. And this speaks to the beautiful complexity of the of, of this topic. Um, so I would generally uh, uh, we we all have multiple identities very 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 few of us are multiply oppressed so 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 i think we all have a responsibility if we're going to highlight the ways in which um structures of inequality play out to disadvantage and exclude or marginalize or oppress others, we should also bring to that conversation the ways in which we are benefiting from those systems. So what does that mean? That could mean in practice, in practice, and again, you know, uh, you know, uh, this is only based on the text we've seen and none of these examples will be ever perfect and none of these illustrations will be ever perfect. It might be talking broadly within your, um, you know, within the school about all of the ways in which, for example, um, uh, language, um, economics, um, uh, uh, having, you know, not, uh, uh, not having um, uh, learning difficulties, um, having good health, uh, po positive health um, uh, kind of well-being. I mean, all of the ways in which people are othered and, you know, included, like having a conversation about all of those rather than, oh, let's put the, the poor disadvantaged people and let me tell you all of the ways in which you're disadvantaged. So have the conversation, but let it be nuanced and complex where you talk about different strands and how we are advantaged and disadvantaged in in uh, by by these systems but absolutely i think i think your instinct is right don't you know like individualize the the the, the people and say well you know there's you poor you there's all of these things happening that are going wrong for you um don't do that step back look broadly and and have conversations about how we're all advantaged and disadvantaged but don't let that be the, the end of the conversation. Like, oh, well, you know, we're all intersectional, we're all inclusive, let's move on. So there's a fine balance there. Yeah, no, no I absolutely agree with you, Diana, I absolutely agree. And the, the one other thing I would add as an educator myself is that I think that the, the beauty of what we can do within education that's so crucial and important to anything that's pretending to be intersectional is to have multiple opinions. And so one of the very simple ways that we can shift education, because a person mentioned um, to, it's difficult, it's important to de discuss these things on the curriculum. One of the things that you see so often is an entire curriculum or a whole, you know, course delivery, and then you've got kind of race and gender tagged on at the bottom at the end as a kind of afterthought or a footnote to what's going on. And I think when we're creating our curriculums, when we're creating our lesson plans or whatever, you know, um, level of education you're teaching at, it's to really understand that these are functions of Euromodernity Euro as an entirety, mm -hmm. right? So it's not actually possible not to talk about these issues, but what you can do is represent multiple voices, not as an afterthought or as a, oh, by the way, let's do equalities 
like in addition to all these other you know topics that we're talking about but really make them fundamental to the and and that's really what you said Diane in, in, in practice make them fundamental to the discussions um one other and I think in having those multiple voices what you see oftentimes in the literature is the most oppressed people have the most powerful uplifting voices right you know people have who have been systemically oppressed have figured out solutions to these things so one of the not solutions as in end result solutions but have a wealth of experience of strategies and and you, you know like I say that life experience of how to address these complicated questions and one of the things that domination does is that it excludes the very voices we should be listening to you know it excludes and and renders you know kind of victims of those people who have spent their life championing these issues and figuring out how to cope with them and and the other thing i i want to just add to that again there's a and i'm just, i'm really bad with names um in terms of researchers but there's a african american woman in california university of california who did some research um where and her research was really about this question of do I raise these difficult conversations because I think that that kind of connects to what was before and what she found is that when um, you hear somebody saying something problematic it's better to challenge it's better to raise the issue even if you do so ineptly clumsily not as eloquently as we might want to it's better to begin the conversation and, and get the ball rolling even if you know you're not perfect and you know, and so I just offer that as a kind of encouragement to all of us who struggle, because I think one of the misconceptions is that, oh, you're black, you're comfortable talking about these things, or this is easy for you because it's your life experience. And, and I think what you touched on, Diane, that kind of feeling of, oh, we all have those feelings around oh, different absolutely. things, you know. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. But absolutely. Is that, like, let's begin the yeah. conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, talking about oomph, um, you know, and like, again, in the spirit, I think the last few conversations we've had are around, all right, what, what are the things that we need to do? And I just want to link, um, link a reflection to that spirit of what are the things we need to do. So um, when we think through, when I think through intersectionality and I want to apply it in a non-Western content a context, for example, I grew up in Nigeria and um, for me, the starting point is what are the what, what are the sources of power or what are the ways in which organize what are the ways in which society is organized that helps us identify what these kind of axes of oppression or systems of oppression. And generally, when you kind of operate in a society, after a little while, you kind of figure out, you know, um, who has power and voice and who doesn't, you know, broadly, and we can look through specific examples. And I say this to anyone who's like, okay, well, what do I need to do? I think the first thing, if you can, is say, all right, how is power organized? I.e., who has decision-making power, who has voice, who has representation, who has money, etc. In I'm speaking very broadly, but if I was going to be really simpli sim um, uh, oversimplify things in Nigeria, um, class, so it's not really ge gender a little, but actually if you're a rich woman, you're kind of okay, right? So it's, it's a gender and class and also what we, so what our ethnic groups. So in that kind of context, the relationship between ethnicity, so not race, but ethnic groups, um, ethnic culture groups, uh, class together probably explain more differential outcomes than gender. And I just use that as another example in which of which we can apply intersectional thinking, like just stop and think, what are the different systems? Like what are the different indicators of power here? And when you start looking at that, you're like, okay, all right. So that's, that's the angle or axes that I want to do something different. And I, 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 I beg your pardon, Gabby, I just want to spend just a little while longer just then answering the question around. So there was a question around intersectional analysis, like what does that look like? How do you can um, gather intersectional data? And, and you've touched on that. So it is, let's be, care, let's be mindful about what questions we're asking. Let's be mindful about how we gather the data, how we contrast, how we um, 
uh, you know, like when we gather it, how we can kind of put it together in terms of analyses. And I just want to give a short anecdote-ish uh, with a conversation about a series of conversations I was having with an organization. So they started with the gender pay gap and like, yeah, gender pay gap, we've done it. Um, yeah, you know, things are looking okay. Um, you know, not as good as we want, but yeah. Da, da. And then they said, all right, let's look at the ethnicity pay gap. Next ethnicity pay gap. And they were like, actually our ethnicity pay gap is nowhere as bad as the gender pay gap. You know, actually we're doing okay in ethnicity. And then we're like, OK, you know what, let's actually look at this data a little bit more. Let's look at where people are based in the country. And then they found that not surprising that the, the reason, the explanation of the low ethnicity pay gap relative to the gender pay gap is because a lot of black men in London were earning a lot of money. So we're like, oh, OK. And I was like, okay, now that's interesting. So, so one of the things to just highlight to our listeners is you ask another question. You probe deeper, you're like, oh, okay, let's understand that. Okay, let's understand that. Anyway, we probed more deeply because I was like, okay, that's interesting. Where are the black men in particular kind of standing out as earning a lots of money? And it turns out when we did additional research that what we strongly suspect was happening is these men were being kept on a pay grade, on a grade, i.e. not offered promotion, and were being kept or retained in the business by being paid more money. So they kept being paid more rather than being promoted. Mm. So that's an example of the value of intersecting analyses. Mm. And, and just to add to that, and I'm thinking here of um, Robbie Schillingham's work um, and, and this question of what we collect and what questions we ask and, and the kind of lens through we, in which we look, where he, he does some research about um, inequalities in education um, and, and race, you know, attainment gaps and so on and so forth. And depending on what statistics or what concepts you use and I know BAME has come under a lot of heat um, in recent years and, and, and rightly so but even if we're just talking within so-called the black um, groups the difference in attainment of black British born in contrast to um, first generation or newer arrivals from elsewhere who come with their own educational traditions was huge and what we're seeing now is a gradual well the pattern was is that the longer as any particular group that comes to England stays in England, you know, the more, the, the greater increase we see in that gap. So there's clearly something about what happens within the education system here. So again, as you say, it's about asking the additional question. Um, and that kind of segues in, in the notion of broadening the conversation. Someone's asked, um, do you have any thoughts about intersectionality and environmental sustainability, um, whether it's on the micro individual level or macro structural level? Any thoughts about that? I, I love this question and um, I'm unable to answer it substantively, but I can just give you one example of one, one kind of experience that I had. Uh, or actually two experiences. Um, so most recently I was invited to a forum that actually asked this question and it's on my kind of watching list. I yeah. wasn't able to attend and I want to watch it. So I am going to watch it. And I say that only to say that for people who are like, oh, okay, that's interesting. That's a new connection. I haven't thought about it before. There's work being done. So I think it's important for us to bring in conversations around the environment with conversations around, um, uh, uh, around social justice and, and um, intersectionality. The second point I'm going to make is when I hear that question, I think where do, I think about where people live and how vulnerable particular neighborhoods are, or particular communities are, or particular countries are to environmental pollution. 
And then you think about communities very generally, us living in segregated places where people who are poorer or, you know, of immigrant backgrounds, et cetera, are kind of put in, in lower quality environments. And that's where the intersect, I don't have the data, but that is where a series of questions uh, could be asked. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I can recommend actually my supervisor edited a work called Racism and Environmental Justice, um, in which you get a real interesting breakdown of how, again, and I think really, Doyen, you really hit the nail on the head. It's asking yourself where, who has the power and the power to do what over who, and you see the same kind of systemic patterns of poor quality of life yeah. clustering around intersections. Um, and, and also, I think another point that if we go back to Kimberly Crenshaw's her tripart kind of rendering of intersectionality and this question about that she raises about making sure we're represented at, within these power dynamics, but also a point that you touched on earlier about who is the face of environmental justice. And when we think about it, it becomes a very middle class whitewash kind of cause, if you like, when which actually hides the fact that there are some really brilliant work going on in black communities around environmental justice. Um, I'm thinking of people like Majora Carter, um, the Gangster Gardener in Los Angeles, and then there's another um, black farming collective over here in the UK, and these kinds of projects and initiatives that just get erased, you know, given the kind of intersectional narrowness of how environmental justice is framed. So part of it is just really as you say, questioning who's in control of what and how the issues as well as people get erased. Um, Absolutely. You know. Gabby, I just want to point, um, so thank you so much for the comments in the chat. They're great. They're feeding our conversations. Um, I just wanted to point out that uh, I'm just looking for, so someone twice has said, can we talk about solutions? Oh. Uh, Dr. Anil Jain, and in, in many, I, I, I sitting here the last 30 minutes has been about solutions and so I'd love you um, uh, Dr. Anil Jane to please spell out some more because we're talking about we we're talking about what you can do when you are for example when you're in teaching when you um, are feeling uncomfortable about conversations when you want to start with a power analysis when you want have to make a decision between different identities like we're about how to conduct intersection analyses um so if you can just unpack your question a little bit more be very very happy to um um to provide more uh, you know to, to, to add to it yeah. Uh, yeah thank you for that there's questions rolling i'm scrolling up and down keeping track so thank you Diane, for that i really appreciate it um and and here's actually another question that that i think is suggesting towards a, a possible solution or something that's necessary somebody has said where is the space to explore that for example a white gay man or couple continues to benefit from the pri privileges of our era in a way that a gay black woman's transgender individual or couple does not so really this question of privilege so and, and where's the space to explore that yeah this is this is live in the in the LGBTQ community, um, you know, you hear about, for example, even like on like Tinder or the, uh, you know, equivalent um, types of platform where they are expressions like that harken back to the, you know, no, no, no blacks, no Jews, no Irish, no dogs. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, they are, their extent, there are regular reports of racism within the LGBTQ community. And the work that we're asking when we think about intersectionality is that when we think through the, the, both the allyship work as well as the, the visibility and the access to equal, kind of equal rights, social justice, the power within the LGBTQ community. So the power that white gay men have within our societies, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the ask or the implications is to think, well, when I'm advocating um, on behalf of the LGBTQ community, what types of members of the LGBTQ community am I leaving out of that conversation? Um, it's that, that, yeah, that, that those are my thoughts and that's, that's the ask. 
Mm. And, and I think just to add to that, um, as you touched on before, uh, well, it's kind of come up a couple of times is about this question of honoring the origins of things sometimes. And I think if we look at kind of social movements, they are often started by, often spearheaded by the most disadvantaged individuals. And, and particularly if we're talking about um, the trans community and, and the black trans community specifically have been at the forefront of the kind of benefits that the rest of us in terms of movements towards justice and the erasure of the contributions of those people, you know, are deeply problematic just as the outcomes of that erasure are as well. And so I think um, for all of us, there's a, for whatever issue, you know, cluster of issues, whatever sector we work in, there's a question around do we, how well do we know the history of the work being done in our area and, you know, chances are if you trace it back far enough, you'll come across a black woman or a black trans woman who, you know, who got things up and ro rolling. So um, honoring those traditions, I think is important. Um, and I'm coming down, so I'm just scrolling through questions. Someone has asked, um, oh, my chat just jumped on me. Something, sorry, I'm scrolling back. That's okay. Um, about how do we, um, Oh gosh, I had it in my head. How do we deal, again, it's a somewhat of a how-to question, but around dealing with um, middle-class white male men in organizations, how do we um, make the challenges that we need to make? How do we deal with these difficult conversations? Um, yeah. The yeah, how, the, the how yeah. I'll, 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 res I'll, I'll respond to that, but I'll also, so Dr. Anil Jain, I've seen your other question, so I will kind of try to kind of wrap these, this response into it. And it's similar to the question from our um, listener from um, the, the US who talked about living in a, um, yeah. a in a non-diverse uh, community and just thought, you know, how is this pertinent? How could this be pertinent? Uh, so I would say to the middle class white man, or there's 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 a probably a an assumption that you know kind of like this work, you know, being uh, beating racism is a good thing, beating racists is a good thing, racism is a bad thing, you know, you fix it, you know, this is I'm a good I'm a good I'm a good person, um, but I think those people who are bad racists need to be um, you know kind of fixed um, or sorted. And so, so the first thing is there's something around what do we do to make this conversation about us, all of us collectively. When I work with organizations, I ask, uh, I ask questions such as, why is this important to you? Well, I start with, well, first off, this isn't about them. This is about all of us because we're all part of this system. So, for example, I say, you know what, in the same way... Um, Serena received the kind of the loose handshake that got her thinking, I'm not quite sure what's happening. In the same way, imagine John had met Bill and Bill walked in to this interview. Bill is like, I mean, John is going to shake his hands like, so good to meet you. What unit did you go? Da, 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 da. Like that minute that Serena's feeling othered and excluded in this parallel universe, Bill is being welcomed and involved and embraced. Those two are re the parallel, but the mirror images. So therefore, it's not just about resolving what happened to Serena. It's about drawing attention to the fact that Bill is benefiting from being someone who looks like what John imagines a senior civil servant should look like. So it's not just about this kind of, you know, a Tina White man saying, well, you know what, we need to just stop treating Serena differently. It is about how do we treat, how do we draw our attention to how we're treating the bills such that we're perpetuating, sustaining the impression that actually you belong, you're one of us, you are part of this in-group. So there's something about recognizing that those both systems of privilege and advantage exist together and we are part of it. And then the second thing or in a list of many other things is, so what does it mean for me? If I see myself as part of the system, what is my own 
uh, kind of almost what's my leadership legacy in some ways? How do I want to shift the system? How do I step back and think what are the ways in which these different inequalities are playing out in our in interpersonal, but actually absolutely like Gabby has said, in terms of our processes, our systems, our procedures. Um, so there are many more things that we could we could say, um, but those are initial kind of reactions like you're in it too. What does it mean for you? And what are you going to do about it by evaluating the system? And I'm just going to say one or two more sentences um, around. Um, so there was a question, for example, that Dr. Jane is saying, saying, why should we do? What about unconscious bias training? Um, Broadly, unconscious bias training um, has limited impact, and it's so limited that when we talk about the nuance of intersectionality work, it is highly unlikely to actually make a difference. So, for example, Dr. Jane, I say this because I've done a review of the effectiveness of unconscious bias training, and it works for a short time under certain circumstances. But one of the things that unconscious bias training doesn't do, or, or the notion of unconscious bias, it doesn't measure multiple identities, right? So already from the basis, it's like it's a single strand issue. So we have very little data on implicit bias and multiple identities. So that's one of the ways in which it's limited. But to answer the question around other solutions, there are no, there are very few one drop training solutions for all of these things. We're having this conversation. We're actually developing our muscle to have these conversations. We're expanding our understanding of the complexity and nuance. This is a solution in itself. Um, I love that some people are, are like, oh, I'm going to talk to someone else about it. We've encouraged you to analyze your data intersectionality. We've encouraged you to interject intersectional thinking. We've encouraged you to say, all right, let's look at power. Let's look at the systems. How are they organized? And what are the indicators of this? All of these are solutions, and I hope that just helps kind of add um, add to your thinking, you know, add to your um, to the thoughts in your mind to 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 our listeners. <laughs>